All right. Well, my name is Al Philreis, as you know, most of you, and welcome back to the Writer's House. Uh, anybody feeling good about being in this room right now? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, don't ask me how these configurations occur, but I guess we'll get to that. Okay, good. Uh, we have two seats up here. Gwen Lewis, come on, get one of those seats. Come on, Gwen, she's running. Gwen Lewis is back in the house. It's great to see you, Gwen. You can sit right here. That's my seat. You can sit here. <laughs> and here comes Katie. All right, good. All right. Well, first and foremost, we've already done this, but let's do it again. Um, welcome back to West Philadelphia and to the Writer's House for the first time, to Questlove. Let's, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to really briefly introduce the format and, and, and talk a little and give some thanks out to some people. Um, uh, so uh, we have uh, copies of the new book, which I'm sure is going to be talked about in the next hour. And there are a few copies left. So buy a copy, and I'm sure you can get it inscribed a few minutes right after the event. So um, if you ha don't already have one, get that. Um, I'm holding the portable mic, and, and I'm going to sit there. And then Anthony and I are going to do our kind of uh, we've known each other a long time eye contact thing and uh, I don't know where that was going but anyway uh, <laughs> and you're and, uh, and I'll know I'll know time. when yeah. he is either run out of questions or wants to turn to you and then I'll pop up semi awkwardly and I'm happy to bring the mic over <laughs> to you for your questions okay because we want to be able to record it and hear it so so there'll be lots of Q&A back and forth so that's what that's what I have here all right couple of thanks um, Allie Katz, are you in the room or near the room? Allie Katz, where, come on, Allie. Come here. Uh, on, a I'm going to embarrass, on a scale of one to 10, on a scale of one to 10, what does this man mean to you? She's a huge fan. And I'll, I'll take 11, thank you. Is our program coordinator and put the, put the whole reception together and is much beloved around thank here, you. Allie Katz. Yeah. Um, so Mingo Reynolds coordinates this, this annual program with Anthony, and she's the best. Mingo Reynolds. Uh, we have many, many superstars in the room. I'm not going to point them all out, but I will shout out to uh, the representative uh, for from our friends from, uh, at XPN 88.5 locally and all over the world, Michaela Majun, the morning host. <laughs> And so now I'm just going to remind you of some of the things that Anthony DeCurtis is great and famous for, and then I'm going to bring it, bring it back to Anthony, and then uh, and, uh, he can get us started. Uh, because you know what Questlove has done is going to be really clear in the next hour, but Anthony is not to be, uh, uh, well, he is to be seconded tonight, but in any case, a close <laughs> no, I, second. I came here for Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's actually what's happened before, and yeah. it's kind of an amazing thing. More than 30 years as a contributing editor of Rolling Stone, and that 30 years went up on a wiki page, Wikipedia page probably five years ago, so let's just say 35 years. Um, a, gra a Grammy for the great notes uh, on the Eric Clapton box set, so he's got a Grammy. Um, Crossroads? Crossroads. Exactly. I did not know that. I, uh, I really came here for Anthony DeCurtis. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first book of his that I read and really enjoyed, in other words, artists talk about life and work. Uh, the soundtrack of my life, the a collaboration with Clive Davis, which is 2013. And he is currently working on a biography, does anybody know? Uh, of Lou Reed, Lou. whom Whoa. a bunch of us, how many of you met Lou in this room a few years ago? <laughs> boy, oh boy. In a way, that's actually an easy act to follow in some ways, but... Uh, <laughs> But in other ways, wow. not. In other yeah, ways, I was about uh, to say, that. you, you have well stories talked. to tell. Yeah. But, <laughs> in any case, uh, so I'm going to sit down and give it to Anthony. But one more time, thank you so much for coming. And let's thank Questlove again. Thank you. Well, I have to say, you know, we've had some really, uh, you know, we've had some talents pass through this room. But the level of enthusiasm, I mean, from the beginning, when I, I said, you know, I think, you know, I can get on mirrored, you know, down here, you know, He's a hometown boy, and uh, yeah, it was, was born three blocks away. Yeah, it's been so exciting, man. Everybody here is uh, is just so happy to to have you here, uh, starting with me. Thank you. Um, one thing, 
<laughs> but, I mean, people are texting from around the world. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, just, uh, it's going up on social media right as we speak. Um, but one of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about, I mean, this is a writing program, obviously, and uh, right. I had, uh, as a, I bring down guests in my class, and uh, this week I had Ken Tucker, who was yeah. a longtime critic at, uh, for anyone here who might not know, is uh, now the television critic at Yahoo, was many, many years at Entertainment Weekly, and... Um, Kim was here? Ken was, yeah. Ken he was, wrote my favorite Rolling Stone review of all time. Well, he was telling me. I yeah. told him you were coming down, and he said that you invited him to speak in your class yeah. uh, that you taught at NYU because of his review of Prince's Dirty, Dirty Mind. Mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I wondered, I thought that would be an interesting place to start. I mean, there's often, I mean, we had Lou Reed here, and mm -hmm. there's often been, you know, kind of contentious relationships between critics and artists. And artists, right. And you're somebody, uh, you know, Reed's critics, you're always very... Um, you know, I mean, has a very kind of three-dimensional attitude about what they do, and right. it's not always easy when people are writing about you. And I, you could start by talking about that review of Dirty Mind, uh, Prince's album that that Ken did, and maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, your feelings about critics and people who write about your work and write about music generally. Um, I read, I read a, a, a well, okay, I was I was heavily involved in the. Um, the the D'Angelo Black Messiah album and um when all the reviews came out in two weeks one one guy uh he he wrote part time for Pitchfork but he he said something on his blog where he sort of said that you know he wonders if I create music uh just from a genuine pure place or do I always have it with my Wikipedia page in mind like <laughs> <laughs> like, um, no, no, no. Well, it, it's. I, I think I'm probably the only artist that's more obsessed with the critical reception of my product as opposed to uh, its commercial value. A lot of that just has to do with. Um, I know for a fact that uh, the the roots tortoise and hare journey uh really is unprecedented you know i mean some of the best bands break up after 10 years like zeppelin 10 years beatles 11 like you know if you're really a thing after your 15th year or your 20th year then that's that's a miracle and so i feel like uh for a, a hip hop group, uh, a hip hop with no known dance single, like we never had a regulate or a, a nothing All but right. a G thing. Like you don't put ours. Yeah. Oh man, it's my son. Yeah, it's like, OPP. Yeah. Right, exactly. Like, yeah. like we've never had a dance single. So for a hip hop group uh, that wasn't dance based and then really didn't fall into uh, the kind of limited categories that black artists are confined to so you know the 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 neo minstrel category or you know we weren't mandingo like we weren't i wasn't opening up my chest anytime soon or <laughs> um we weren't apolitical and so and we were oh also a band you know which was kind of an anomaly back then um and it took us four albums to really finally hit bullseye. So it's just like our critical swag, our Metacritic rating. Metacritic is, uh, like I guess for artists. Or something. Yeah, well, like Rotten Tomatoes is for movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, you go on Metacritic and if you score higher in the 80, that, that's a miracle. Um, so yeah, like you have a higher, they have a higher rating than like Radiohead. I mean, other bands that you would think critics, you know, totally worshipped. I mean, the Roots records have, you know, scored on that scale among people who love music and love to write about it. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, because of the 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 critical reception that our albums have gotten uh, over time, that's what really has prevented. Uh, from the invisible guillotine button being pressed when it comes to, down to 
okay, do we keep them or don't we keep them? You know, I mean, there's prestige artists for other types of genre, but there really isn't. I mean, hip hop is a very disposable art form. You know, you could be selling out uh, Madison Square Garden for two nights. And then, you know, you can barely sell out Highline Ballroom in New York City six years later. So to me, not having a plan B, I mean, for those of you who follow me on social media, you know, like, I have 16 jobs. So I've just really been <laughs> overly obsessed with having insurance. So <laughs> like, just having a plan B or D, E, F, G, and and so on. Um, and I guess, I, I guess the only area in which we could be equal to someone in my eyes uh, was how the critical reception was. And um, I don't know, just as a kid, uh, growing up in a musical household, my dad's uh, band members would often have like Rolling Stone magazines uh, and rehearsal and you know the, the rehearsals were like five to six hours so it was like really boring and sit by the record player and look at the 45s and you know then maybe look at the cassettes and then start reading Rolling Stone so uh, I guess when I was four or five I would try to guess what the rating was so I get a Rolling Stone cover up the rating read the review and then guess like okay is that, was that a three and a half or four or that sort of thing. But I, I always notice that, um, y you know, only a, a certain type of black artist would get the attention of the magazine. Um, usually a prestige artist, you know, a Smokey Robinson here, or a Hendrix retrospective there. Um, so when I saw the Ken Tucker review of Dirty Mind, now all I knew of Prince at that moment in uh, December of 1980 uh, was based on my sister's enthusiasm for him. <laughs> she was in high school. So, you know, the, the only periodical that was really geared towards young black teens uh, in the late 70s or in the 70s and the 80s was like right on magazine. So a lot of pinups and posters of uh, like prints on the wall. Side note, uh, J-Lo's manager, Benny Medina, he always has pause and freezes every time he sees me because he, I know his real dirty secret. Like, Benny, Benny Medina's life is based on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Like, he's the, the, he's the story of, that's who Will Smith is playing. Um, but not many know that, uh, I guess, Benny was friends with the, uh, the Gordy children, Barry Gordy's kids. Uh, one of uh, Red Food's, Red Food's father from uh, LMFAO was also a member of this like rock disco band that they had in the 70s. And I don't know, right on magazine, like I knew of Benny Medina as the poster on my wall. So whenever <laughs> I see him in manager mode, you know, with JLo or whatever, like they have no idea that he was like a, a team pop sensation. <laughs> but my whole point was besides right on magazine, like you really couldn't find information um, in any other type of periodical. And then on top of that, being as though Rolling Stone was, you know, the, the, the critical Bible, for them to pay attention to frothy fodder that my sister liked, I thought that was something. And I noticed that, like, whoa, four and a half stars is, that, that's important. Like, that, that, that is something. And it just, I don't know why it stuck with me because, I mean, again, I was only nine years old. Like, what nine-year-old really cares about critical reception of <laughs> of an artist that wasn't even allowed in the household at the time. Like, <laughs> like, I wasn't even allowed to buy Dirty Mind. Like, I'd never heard the record. Like, it wasn't like I went out and brought the record the next day. Like, I didn't wind up buying that album until like five, six years later when I was a teenager. But I knew, I knew that uh, Prince's life really wasn't going to be the same once the critical Bible had gave him... Uh, that reception. And it didn't happen for him instantly, but you know, eventually through time, like he became a critical favorite. So I would, uh, starting with that issue of Rolling Stone, um, I would obsessively go and paste every lead issue, uh, lead review 
the way that Lee reviews are, they have like a, a an illustration and the review, and I, you know, six seven years later, the entire bedroom wall is is filled with uh, lead reviews of Rolling Stone. And then I always kept one open space for my own, if, the, if that would ever come one day. And uh, the ironic thing about it was when uh, our fourth album, Things Fall Apart, got reviewed and the lead review, like I was more obsessed with the illustration <laughs> as opposed to the rating or what was written about it. Like I knew it was gonna get a good reception and. Uh, this is the problem with being in a band with seven people. Uh, the illustrator forgot to include me in the... Oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> all six members of the Roots are represented, <laughs> except for the one very distinctive six foot three, 300 pound Afro of the group, so. Wow. Yeah. I'm so happy I wasn't the editor of the review section when that <laughs> happened. Uh. But, you know, reading Mo Meta Blues, I was really struck, like, you know, uh, I mean, often, I mean, as, as somebody who edited that section for five years, and, you know, you would go into, you know, Kurt Loder's review of a Neil Young record or something yeah. like that, and I, it was just like, wow, you know, I, I, you know, read a lot of this stuff, and it's not often that artists engage it as, as fully as you did, and obviously you have a, a whole perspective on it, um, but... One of the things, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the roots and you know, bands and groups that last, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that struck me, you know, in, in some of the stuff, you know, talking to you and also kind of reading stuff you've written and reading stuff written about you is, um, you know, almost like, you know, this kind of relationship, you know, that you have with Black Thought and, and you know, what, you know, kind of his stance. I mean, at one point, I think you said, you know, I'm I'm creating music. I mean, I want Pitchfork. I'm thinking about Slate. I'm thinking about you know the kind of reception we're going to get. He's thinking about the barbershop. The barbershop, yeah. You know, and like you know that kind of thing. And it's almost like you know when you think about you know like Lennon and McCartney and Jagger and Richards and those kinds you know that kind of tension that exists in these bands. You know, um, and you know I wonder if you kind of you know experience it like you know kind of along well, those that, lines. That synergy, that synergy, I feel helps. Fuel the band. Uh, the 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 long running joke of, I guess the our long running joke of, what was our key to survival or longevity? Um, even though we would joke about it, it was partially true. Uh, I always said the answer was two tour buses. <laughs> <which> <laughs> and for the longest, uh, yeah, it was there was Gryffindor and Slytherin. That was our <laughs> <laughs> Slytherin was the debaucherous rock star tour bus, and Gryffindor was the the, the geek tech bus. <laughs> I, I won't divulge which one I was a part of. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's weird. We, if I kind of have a regret of, I don't necessarily have a, a regret about this journey, because again, it's like who is still who still matters 21 years after they came out like it's you know this this is unmarked un, uncharted territory like it's like a landmine step every like are we still here like what's <laughs> wrong um however um in in the very specific case of two x outcast and kanye west uh, both of whom really kind of made a thing of their contradictions. I mean, the idea of a Quimini was, you know, uh, Big Boy and, and, and Andre being totally opposite of each other. And, you know, uh, the beauty of the college dropout, Kanye's record, is the idea that He's the everyday man, but still struggling for the materialism that's kind of teased and and flaunted by, you know, the carrot on the stick theory of which. Where's my damn massage? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's and it's. Uh, I'll say that for the longest, we did a lot to sort of suppress. Uh, 
Tariq's uh, normal. I, I guess the perception of the roots is well, people will think of me first, and not saying that okay, well, the roots are supposed to be this mental level intelligence or whatever, but it's it's both of us are. I guess at the time I was just more afraid, and my manager uh, Richard, who's a big part of the book, um, we were kind of worried that our angle, like the thing that made us unique and special. Because a lot of the times, you know, people will come to us uh, at the end of shows and uh, it, it wasn't a neg, but it was like a backwards compliment. Like people would say like, you know, well, I like you guys because you're not. And just... <laughs> Somebody that you actually yeah, liked like, and who had hits. Yeah. In, in the beginning, it was <laughs> yeah, like, well, yeah. you, you guys aren't like Dr. Dre. And then <laughs> later it was like, you guys aren't Tupac, you know. And then you guys aren't Lil Wayne. Like, I like you guys. And... Even even for us to get our foot in the door, like the first two years, nah, we we weren't even a rap group according to our like our agent. Like, oh, they do spoken word and <laughs> and jazz and yeah, there are these beats underneath and they talk on top. Yeah, and, exactly. Know, like, 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 yeah, yeah, a, yeah, a lot like, of yeah. a lot of our ninety two to ninety four bookings. I mean, because just off the top, if you say rap group, then instantly you think ah. I gotta get more insurance. I gotta get extra security, <laughs> and people really weren't understanding back then. But um, you know, it's 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 weird now that contradictions are so accepted. And you know, this is this is the generation, the millennial generation is is the generation of blending and mixing in. Like it's at least the idea of this sort of. Uh, Goulage or this this mixture of of all things being mixed in and blurred lines, you know that's that's what this generation is is. I think that that will be its legacy, or at least the beginning of that. And it's just weird that we tried so long to kind of cover up that normalcy. Because there, I mean, there would be times where, especially like in two thousand three, like I remember when um, we'd be in the studio. And maybe if Quali or Kanye or Common were next door and Tariq would walk in, they'd be like, wait, can you take us to Barney's with you? Like, I was like, no, don't let, don't tell people you go to Barney's. Like, <laughs> who does that? <laughs> you know, but now it's, 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 it's a thing. So, I mean, not with just that, with just in general, you know. So, um, I do think that synergy and that, that contradiction, uh, served the group well, even though we were really trying to keep that in the closet as long as we could. You, you know? know, one of the things that really struck me also about your book is um, y your relationship with Rich Nichols. I mean, who unfortunately yeah. died, you know, last year. But, um, you know, as your manager, I mean, I always, uh, obviously, uh, you know, John Landau manages Bruce Springsteen, who's the former Rolling Stone reporter, and, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who's been around the magazine. I mean, I've happily gotten to know him fairly well through one thing and another and I've written about Bruce a lot and I always kind of envied in a certain way like their relationship I mean it was more than just somebody who makes deals like they conceptualized yeah. you know what they were going to do and that sort of really seemed like the way you know you worked with Rich and you know that kind of an amazing sort of dynamic and I wonder if you can you know sort of talk about like the importance of that and you know kind of what it meant to you and what he did. I mean, what for those that haven't read the book, I guess the, the magic of the book is, well, first of all, I didn't want to write the book. <laughs> That's um, also baked into the book is like a very an interesting kind of thing of letters to the, to, not letters to the editor like a newspaper, but you know, the writer that you were working with writing to the editor and the editor writing back and wondering, you know, is this book happening? And, you know, what's going on? And is he really doing it? And the you know, long feeling letters back, you know, saying yes, you know, he's being, but, you yeah. know. And the whole sort of infrastructure of how a book like that gets done, I mean, having done one with Clive Davis you know, recently, uh, you know, it was just, it was hilarious to sort of be reading it and and uh, and seeing all of those kind of bones exposed in a way. Yeah, like, I'm I'm a fan of, uh, I guess, uh, the idea of Easter eggs or, like, commentary. Often I'll get DVDs and just watch the commentary with the 
with the uh, the caption on it. Um, and I always felt like, I mean, the roots are eight or 17 uh, very different individuals. Um, and I knew that going first that people might take whatever I say as law. Um, but I'm also wise enough to know that, you know, my perception of things um, was is is night and day. Like, you know, for every parade that you have, that's that's at the expense of someone else that has to do the the the, the groundwork for you. Um, so I guess really having built-in guilt for not guilt, but just I wanted all of us to have a say. Like, if 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 it were really up to me, I'd probably make it an oral history. Like, I'm a really big fan of oral history stories. Like, if you get the the live from New York, it's Saturday night, the expanded version. Like, that's an incredible account of Saturday Night Live. Like, there's great stories and horrible stories mixed in. Um, so I insisted that if I do this book, that uh, Richard, I mean, the way that Richard, I mean, what Peter Grant is to Led Zeppelin, what uh, what John is to Springsteen, uh, I guess George Martin to the Beatles, I mean, Richard was really just, I mean, for, he was, first of all, I mean, he was like our father. A lot of us didn't have fathers. I had a father, and I was fortunate to grow up uh, in my formative years and my later years with both parents, but, um, and he just had relentless, rigorous honesty about him to the point where you just never insulted or your feelings were hurt. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd probably quit the band. Like, that was, you know, I'd, I'd always quit the roots probably four months into the record. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's like, okay, well, it's my group, but I still have to audition this song. Like, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? And everyone's all, eh, whatever, it's cool. And <laughs> like, so dismissive. And ah! and then you quit, and they're like, yeah, you'll be back in three weeks. And then <laughs> I'm back in three weeks. So the way the way that the narrative is in the story, I mean, I'll tell. You know, I, I'll make this. I'll make the story sound exciting. Like, okay, well. D'Angelo and I made this, you know, voodoo record for four years, and it was such an amazing journey. And you know, then we wanted to take it out on the road, and you know, life was great. And then there's always an asterisk there, of which you go to the bottom, where Rich would just totally just <laughs> knock that down. Like, please, that was the worst time of our lives. Like, <laughs> Kamal couldn't buy Pampers for his babies because we gave up all this tour money because you weren't there. And da 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 da. So just the the again the, the the contradiction of stories really makes it a, a I think a a really great read and yeah it has a lot of texture you know precisely and wisdom, for that reason yeah yeah and so um, at the time I mean Rich had really been struggling um, with leukemia and uh, he really really I mean he wasn't given that that much time to survive but he was so relentless with his uh with his strength to finish it um you know he really he didn't even want to start his operation process until the book was finished and then our last roots album was done i mean he practiced he produced it in his hospital bed you know like just a lot of the mixing and approval stuff. I mean, he had his computer with him, so he was able to still communicate that way. But, you know, the last year of his life was really a struggle. But he kind of the, 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 the weirdest thing about working on this next record, and, you know, Tariq and I discussed it. I'm like, wow, like, we really... We have to to grow up because I I think we were going to end with our last album, and then I woke up and I'm like, wait a minute, if if one day people look at my discography, and there's there's no type of I mean there's no album that I'm not 
proud of. I mean, I have feelings about the tipping point, but more on that later. <laughs> um, you know, but I was trying to figure out if people just see, like, our last album is And Then You Shoot Your Cousin, which, again, like, our last three albums were just con con concept records. At th and the way we, we had other income coming in, then it was just like, all right, it's art record time. Like, we don't have to... They get drop us, they're not drop us. Like, we're, we're just gonna make these dangerous art records now. Um, I didn't know if I wanted that to be our last statement, and I thought it would be rather apropos to see if Tariq and I could do one go round with everything that we learned from Richard. So, um, it, we're, it's gonna be a slow process, but uh, I, I think that. We'll we'll do it justice, but yeah. Now now we have to grow up. Like he's always been in the driver's seat, and now Tariq and I have to get in the passenger in the driver's seat and steer the car. Well, you know, one of the other things that's uh, changed in recent years, and you know, is just kind of the, the the kind of spotlight that you know, obviously being on Fallon has brought you. You know, which is you know, a lot of ways, you know, been an, a tremendous opportunity and. You know, it's been exciting. I mean, just as you know, it's just there you are at the Grammys, and there you are, you know, playing at the Academy Awards, and mm -hmm. you know, the level of visibility has just kind of like skyrocketed. And I wonder, you know, that can be a tricky business, um, you know, for people. I mean, you know, in many ways, you've always been somebody who's kind of had your feet on the ground. But I wonder, um, you know, how's that been for you? Um, okay, so we started. We actually, what what makes this really beautiful that we're all here, um, you know, for those that don't know the Roots backstory, we started, I mean, we started in 87 back in uh, creative and performing arts, um, but we really started taking it seriously in 92 when we started busking, uh, the, the idea of being a street musician, put a box or a hat on the ground and you play on the streets. Um, our home base was in South Philadelphia uh, on Fifth and Pass Young, but our, our second base was always on this campus, like just playing in front of, is, is Billy Bob still here? Uh, Billy Bob's, no, oh, they changed it? Well, it's a little light, it's 240th and Street. They moved it? Oh, damn it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that whole go. corner of like 40th and Spruce, like that was where I, like I, I grew up on 52nd Street in Osage, so 12 blocks away. Um, this is, you know, this was our beginning. Um, but the thing, but the thing about uh, our particular journey was that um, we came at a time in which I guess the innocence of hip hop was just slowly going out the window. And so uh, a lot of that due to when when Dr. Dre's The Chronic came out in 92, that was the first time that a, a very credible, well-respected hip hop artist did big numbers. Anything before it was like novelty acts or like, eh, that guy's not a real credible hip hop artist, but I won't name names, but <laughs> you get the point. Um, and then hip hop, it, it's it's the this it's the equivalent of Eve biting the uh, the apple. Like hip hop knew it was naked, and suddenly it had choices to make. And it's like commerce or art, commerce or art. We've we've always faced that battle. I mean, of course we chose art because a lot of people think we chose the art route because well, you know, we're taking the high road and and we have morals, and of course we're not going to sell out our art form, but. I'll be honest with you, we just did not know how to make a hit. So, <laughs> 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 like, if you come up and say, like, uh, we want you to do, like, the, you know, 30-minute version of Stravinsky's Rites of Spring, and <laughs> I could do that in my sleep, but, you know, you asked me to do a three-minute pop song, I, w I would love to know how to do Shake It Off or something. <laughs> no, I, there's an art, there's an art to connecting the people, and I... I'm learning now, but um, you know, so we had to take the high road and and really work hard and and 18 years of 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 doing this. Um, after a while, it gets it gets tedious, and for a lot of the band members who suddenly have family members, saying goodbye at the airport 
became a very painful thing to do because now it's one thing when they're like eight, nine months, but it's a whole nother thing when you're missing ballet recital and soccer practice because um, you got to go to Australia for like five weeks. Uh, and so we were always hoping and wishing for like something like a, a Celine Dion moment. But <laughs> I mean, that, that was seen as a standard. Like Celine Dion can be in one place and make that much money and, you know, have stability. What was that for hip hop? Like there was one moment in which we were like considering doing that same thing like for Atlantic City. But um, it, it just didn't feel right. And we didn't go with it. But, um, you know, Fallon comes along. Um, in the strangest way because, well, I used to, what I do for Fallon now, I used to do for the Chappelle show. Um, so after that imploded, after season three, the Africa exodus, <laughs> what have you, <laughs> um, suddenly we were all without jobs. <laughs> and um, Dave's co-creator, Neil Brennan, was approached by Lauren Michaels to possibly direct and head uh, late Night with Jimmy Fallon. Uh, he decided he wanted to do movies instead, but he stayed on as consultant. And as a consultant, it was sort of like a, a running joke, like, well, oh, and then you can get the roots to be your, your house band. That'd be funny, right? And knowing that we wouldn't do it. They really said that, like, well, why don't you ask the roots, as in we know musicians, we can recommend a good house band. Um, <laughs> but Jimmy literally just asked the roots. <laughs> <laughs> and what really makes it crazy is that uh, I had moved to um, I had well I had begged my manager I'm, I'm one of the few artists that will actually treat his business manager like his father like even now like I'll swipe the card and then I know that call's coming like <laughs> yo did you really need that $500 steak Amir like <laughs> Like no, I I like he's very strict on, you know, me not going overboard with with spending. So, once in a while he'll let me do something that I shouldn't do, uh, of which I thought it was wise to uh, get a resident uh, in Silver Lake, California. And uh, he said, "No, you're going to purchase this house, and then you're going to go on tour, and then just sit there and collect dust, and you'll never move in, and you'll waste the money." I was like, no, I won't, no, I won't. Yeah, I did. So <laughs> cut to eight months later, uh, I finally moved in the, the spot, and we had a, a gig in UCLA. And uh, first day, and I guess at a red light, saw Jimmy Fallon, and he's like, I got to ask you something. And <laughs> cut to me moving back east, like after moving all my stuff out west. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even then, when he when he approached us with the idea of doing late night television, um, I didn't take him serious. I mean, I, I knew we weren't going to do it because we we had struggled so long to finally get to a good, sweet monetary spot where we could, you know, do twenty gigs in a month and really come home with a profit. And it's like, who wants to? We worked twenty years to get to this place. Um, we knew we were going to say no, but we still courted him anyway. The Roots have a habit of doing that. Like, <laughs> even with our record deal, like we did it for the free dinner. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. We know we're signing with this label, but she's going to take us to get lobster and steak. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm not lying. Like, we took, we took this woman, and she lobster and steaked us up, and... <laughs> We even got cocky, like we were like, "Yeah, we want this, that, this, that, and the other, that." that <laughs> da, 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 da. And we went overboard, knowing that she wasn't going to grant the wish, but we just wanted that steak and lobster dinner. And then uh, the next day, our lawyer called, and she's like, uh, "Well, guys, she accepted that offer, so oh, okay, we'll go with her." <laughs> that's 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 kind of not what happened with Fallon, but basically, he was backstage and. Um, the next thing I know, I had to do like an interview or something uh, for the student union at uh, at the college, and then I come out my dressing room, and it's and it's Jimmy and the Seven Roots in a human pyramid. 
<laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I looked at Rich. I was like, yo, dude, we're stuck with this motherfucker, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and Rich, who's ever the cynic, like, think of the most cynic, cynic, dry person you know, like, Stephen Wright dry. Like, he was just like, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I knew that is because Jimmy, in five minutes, completely disarmed the most guarded group. Like, we're so, we're, we're guarded with each other. <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you something about the Oscars last week. When, when I was uh, doing the bit with uh, the Lonely Island, I was sitting there watching those guys, and um, Andy Sandberg comes to me, and I was just like, I was shaking my head, and I was like, yo, you guys are really friends. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, well, wait, you're like really friends, friends. Like, you guys are acting like you do on those Saturday Night Live shorts. Like, <laughs> you're really friends. And he's like, yeah, well, how else would this ever work? And I was just like, man, like, even it was just amazing to me that. I'm not saying that we're not like that, but I will say that Fallon has started the process of really melting melting the ice uh, because it's eight of us, and we've been together for so long. And I mean, we've fought over the most minuscule, you know, hiding the almond milk in the tour thing. Or <laughs> <laughs> who took all the mucilix or... <laughs> it's always over food, like who ate the last... That sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, the, the, the Fallon thing totally changed the situation because I thought this was going to be a stability job where we can all be in one place and we'll just quietly retire off the radar and we can make the same amount of money that we were making slaving 225 days out the year. And I thought it was going to be a nice, cushy, quiet retirement gig. And it's turned out to be the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, now I know there's a very long-winded response. I'm sorry. I, I just realized yeah. now yeah. I, I always hate when James Spader comes on The Tonight Show because he tells the best, most boring stories of all time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> The Roots kind of play this like time game, like, okay, how long before Jimmy nods off thing? <laughs> <laughs> I promise to do more succinct, like, no, direct answers. No, no, no. Anyway, man. no, no, I'll do it, because Jimmy said the same thing, but you're like, ah, damn it, quest love. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll say that the way that Fallon really benefits our situation uh, in another area is that uh, for all of my, for all, for all of my uh, praise of, Gladwell's 10,000 hour theory. Um, I could probably count the times that the Roots have actually rehearsed, maybe on one hand, between 92 and 2008. Because a lot of it is, you know, we do these mammoth three hour Springsteen length shows, and I always felt like, no, I don't, it'll give the magic away if we rehearse it. Like, let's save it for the show. Um, but this is the first time that we've rehearsed as a band. Now I feel like we kind of cheated our fan base because we're way better musicians <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> and composers and producers and engineers, like we're so much better now having to be disciplined uh, into rehearsing two to four hours every day, like for the last uh, six years. So I feel like we're a whole new group. Well, you know, I mean, a couple of things. One I think is... Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's, it's a, a kind of truism now, but a true truism. I mean, you guys have really reinvented what, like, music on a late night show can be like. Yeah, I mean, Edwin and Fallon, obviously, very much involved in that. I mean, it's just an incredible collaboration. But the point about, you know, your long-winded answer before we open the floor, um, I don't know, you know, I always, um, you know the documentary filmmaker, D.A. Pennybaker? Yeah. Yeah, and... Um, 
I saw him on a panel one time. Maybe he's talking about filming Monterey and his shot mm-hmm. of Hendrix burning his guitar. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was talking about, like, you know, he didn't really have a lot of cameras and, you know, they didn't even know what Monterey was going to be or right. any of that stuff. And um, he said, well, you know, my philosophy about, um, you know, we also made Don't Look Back with Bob Dylan. And um, because, you know, my philosophy about documentary filmmaking is I put the camera on something because I don't like quick cuts. I don't like any of that stuff that, you know, we've all gotten used to. He goes, I put the camera on something and I keep it there until something more interesting happens. That's my approach to interviewing, mm-hmm. you know, and so I don't, uh, you know. And good night. Thank you. If somebody, <laughs> so, if somebody <laughs> is uh, somebody bringing it, you know, and uh, has something to say, it's like, why get in the way of it? Thank you. Um, but let's open the floor and hear some other questions. We uh, have a question back here. Oh, we have a question back there. <laughs> well, how's it going? Uh, my name is uh, Jean-Philippe, and I- I'm really happy to see you. I'm, I just walked in and came into this whole situation. I'm definitely very uh, pleasantly surprised. Oh, thank you. But um, I, I want to say, um, did, uh, I, one of the times I saw you perform was with uh, Barack Obama. Um, okay. Just right in West Philadelphia. I was wondering if you had like any like stories that like went along with that whole situation. Uh, was it West Philadelphia or North Philadelphia? It was West Philadelphia. Oh, I remember that show. Remember the show. Remember the show. Remember the show. It was in a baseball the, field. The president was there. Uh, it was like, I was like, <laughs> oh, Barry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get yeah. it. I get it. Exactly. That guy. Um, I will say, I will say that, um, I mean, both years, but especially in 2007, 2006, 2007, um, that was, that was, that was like one of the most exciting times of my life, like in terms of just, just the whole process of campaigning. Um, and it, First of all, it helped me deal with the the number one fear that you would you would never guess it now, but my number one fear in life, as some of you are starting to snooze off, is public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> no, back then I, I you know it was horrible, and they just like threw me in the river. I'm like, oh, what do you guys want me to do? Like initially, I thought, okay, I'm just going to volunteer for you guys, maybe answer some phones, and you know get some lunch, drive to the polls. <laughs> No, and I did that. I did that a lot. Um, but then they were like, okay, guy, like, j- j- stop playing. Like, you know wh- why we brought you here. We didn't buy you here for turkey sandwiches. Like, you got to, we want you to speak and perform and gather the people. And um, so I'll say that definitely uh, around 2006, 2007, um, 2008, um, I did a lot of growing up and getting over a lot of major f- fears. I don't remember the show specifically because we've done it a lot with him. But um, yeah, I, I will say that um, it's it just not even politically aware, but just aware of myself and the power that I never knew I had or maybe was afraid that I had. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Imani has a question. Um, yeah, so. One of the first things I thought when I heard Black Messiah was that it had this incredible archive behind it, right? That there's all these references right. to other work. And that immediately sounded to me like you, because you are this incredible archivist mm-hmm. musically. And you see it both, and, and you have these, in these archives, but you also curate. And I was curious about how that impulse develops, right? And is it something that happened organically? Was it deliberate? Were you trying to, you know, were you, how, how did that come about? Um, Black Messiah is way different than how voodoo developed. Voodoo, I'll say that voodoo started in Philadelphia like the last day of The Roots' third album, Philadelphia Half-Life, was kind of the first day of recording the voodoo album, which took four years to do. Um, and I consider those four years college, because first of all, we were trying to figure each other out. I'm th- like the 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 kind of uh, energy that I hate making all these uh, Disney references, like the the Fox and the Hound, <laughs> when they were friends. When they were friends. <laughs> 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 well, wait. If you actually think about it, we fought a lot. Yeah. So we are the Fox and the Hound. Forget it. The <laughs> whole story. Um, yeah. In the beginning. Uh, I didn't realize it until the first year end 
that um, Richard sort of, my manager Richard kind of uh, told me that, you know, all of this is for naught until you develop a movement. And I didn't quite get what that meant. And he's like, well, you know, some of the best artists can do it alone and try, but really the only people that succeed on their own are like novelty artists or the guys that did Macarena, <laughs> you know. Or, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I forgot their names. Um, but really a lot of the success that you see in the music industry is contextualized on the idea of a movement. You like Stevie Wonder, but no, he's associated with Motown. Diana, Smokey, Eddie Kendrick's Temptations. You like Justin Timberlake? Yeah, but he's also contextualized with the idea of Disney. Britney, Christina, well, not Ryan Gosling, <laughs> but you get the point. Um, and so in our case, uh, around 1996, suddenly all the birds of a feather started being friends with each other. Erica, D'Angelo, Tip, Most Def, Quali, Common, Jay Dilla. And we just, luckily, all of us, like, I, I think that if I intentionally said, okay, like, <laughs> I'm going to put you guys together and that sort of thing, it would have never worked. But we just all were at Electric Lady Studios for about a good six years and working on each other's records and working with the ideas. And then it was like college. Now, in the case of Black Messiah, I'll say that that idea of that movement, what we call the Soul Quarian movement, um, it really, it, it imploded in 2003 because none of us thought that we were going to get mass acceptance. You know, roots go platinum. You've got to be crazy. Like, that would never happen in this lifetime. And then suddenly, like, we won a Grammy and go platinum. And, well, what do we do? And Common started going platinum. And then we stopped calling each other because we were too busy. And we stopped hanging. Um, and D'Angelo's demons was that he just, he, he works hard, but he really resents the, he resents the, the success in terms of the surface success. We go on tour, girls would rush the stage and he'd be ble like grabbing his shirt and keep band-aids on standby and the last day the last day of the voodoo tour which is like the greatest music experience of my life i, I was just like yeah man so wh what are we going to do like i was trying to figure out like well are we going to make another record or what's up and he just said man like fuck this shit man i want to i'm gonna go in the backwoods and get fat grow a beard <laughs> like he his idea was like, you know, Marvin Gaye before Tammy Terrell's death, he was felt clean cut. And then when What's Going On came out, he had a beard, put on a little weight, you know, wanted to be taken seriously. Um, he really, really resented the, the Chippendales aspect of take it off, take it off. Like, they didn't care about the show. They just wanted to see him naked. Um, so a lot of that anger and resentment of, you know, I, I know it's like Cry Me a River, D'Angelo, you're a piece of meat, uh, whatever. <laughs> um, but he's, he's, a sensitive, he's a sensitive soul, so uh, I'll say the first four or five years, like, he, that, that was the demons he was wrestling with, and that's why he heard about the DUIs and, the, you know, why his mugshots were horrific looking. Like, he was literally self-sabotaging and destroying the, the, the temple of what he built. Um, I think things started to slowly come together, well, slowly, as in a song a year. It took us 14 years to make this record. Uh, in 2005, and my first day back, like really back, I, I guess I came back in like 2007, was the fact that I entered that studio and was laughing at the fact that it was still 1996 like the same instruments from Voodoo, the same tape player. I'm like, CD players, you, you don't have MP3? Like, where's the computer here? 
You, what do you mean you don't have Wi-Fi? Like it was, it was literally the way that we left it, and you know, I guess we just took advantage of it. Like it's, it's, it's not dated for him because his sounds is a very unique sound on its own. So, um, you know, it, this was a very hard album to make. I mean, a lot of people put their lives on the line, their jobs on the line, like, and when I mean hard to make, like, it, like, the, 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 the documentary of this album, you know, it, 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 the only way I can describe it is if you, if you're a film buff, uh, you ever see the documentary for uh, Apocalypse Now? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. No, this, this yeah. was the, this was the musical version of the, no. <laughs> I mean, it's brilliant, it's beautiful, but a lot of pain went into this record, so that's what you hear. We have a question here from RJ. Hey, hey, so I guess this maybe relates to one of your other hats and your work as a DJ. It's a pretty specific question, but I'm just curious. I follow mm -hmm. you on Instagram. I have this memory from a million years ago. Maybe it was like Philly Mag, something like that. It was just like a photo shoot of you in your record room. Yeah. I'm obsessed with that. So I just want to know some like quick questions. Do you have yeah. a sense of how many records you have, but almost more importantly, what's your cataloging like? <laughs> wow, man! Sorry. It, it depends on you. The have the opened up a big moment. door, yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, um, it's up to. We're we're close to somewhere between last count was seventy five to eight hundred. Uh, the room that I have can hold slightly under hundred thousand. I think it can hold about ninety thousand pieces of wax. Uh, I built that room after. Uh, Q-Tip of a tribe called Quest uh, lost his entire collection uh, and all of his archives in a house fire. And at the time when I was living in South Philadelphia, all these records were in my house. So it was kind of like an Indiana Jones mission to not crack a record. So, you know, take a date home from night and like, okay, baby, now you got to jump over. You ready? Two, <laughs> three. <laughs> <laughs> I kept all the good records in the bathroom. That way, I, I you know, I knew it wouldn't crack it. Um, as far as the uh, the the archiving of it all, um, I I do it by genre, so I know where the Prince related records are versus the. You know, uh, spoken word albums versus the comedy records versus the 12 inches versus the, you know, the, they're in specific. It's, it will probably never truly get righteously archived in this lifetime. But, um, you know, I, I, it's one of, one of my biggest uh, dilemmas is moving, really moving to New York and taking that room with me, like, you know, then I'll feel like I've moved to New York and Philadelphia will hate me for that. So <laughs> I still have that room here. Yeah. We're going to go over here. Perfect. Okay. Hi. Um, hearing you speak about your childhood and your inspiration of the reviews and reading mm -hmm. that at such a young age, as a middle school teacher in Philadelphia, I'm just wondering your experience in middle school, if you had any particularly inspiring texts, teachers, anything. Just well, curious. I went, I didn't go to an average school. I went to. Uh, the Philadelphia, uh, well, it, at one point there was a Philadelphia uh, school, what do we call it? PAS, Performing Arts School. Um, it was the private school version of Creative and Performing Arts. At one point, both schools represented, well, no, the private school represented first through 12th. Um, and really, since we were on the, 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 the campus of University of the Arts on Broad Street, um, all of us were just amalgamated. So, you know, we, you take your regular classes in the day, but then for all the, the, the ballet majors, you know, you could be a, a fifth grade, uh, one of my fifth grade classroom uh, mates still t taking college level ballet with uh, either the seniors or, and the same with music. Um, 
I, you know, unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, I'm mean, restricted to like triangle. <laughs> like, <laughs> they wouldn't let me on the timpanies in third grade. But you play the triangle, Thompson. Okay. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, nah, I mean I was tall for a youngster, but um, yeah, my my entire childhood was immersed in the weirdest. I mean, before the idea of Glee. I mean, I used to just say fame. But I, I guess it's more like Glee now. Like, I mean, kids used to really, truly, like, break out in song in the hallways. And on top of that, we were right next door to Philadelphia International Records. So growing up at a time where, you know, you'd run out 1230 every day to see Teddy Pendergrass get attacked by the women. And, <laughs> you know, maybe the Jacksons will come this time. And, you know, uh, that that's that's the that's sort of the environment that uh, I grew up in. And really, life didn't start until after 3. Like, most people rush home after 3 o'clock and go home. But uh, my sister, who who was older, went there. Like, we'd get home at, like, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Like, it was what happened between 3 and 9. That's where the real education started. So, like, uh, sometimes it was problematic. Like, I'd come home. I think it's a little problematic for a parent to hear if you want to get down, down on the ground, cocaine. <laughs> Where'd you learn that at? School? <laughs> What's cocaine? Then, you know, like, <laughs> parents be in the principal's office the next day, so, you know, it's, that's, that's what life was like. We have one more question from the audience and then back to Anthony. Okay. Um, you talk a lot about collaborating with different people, whether it's working with the same seven people since, you know, 92, 93, mm -hmm. or working recently on things like with the Lonely Island um, for the Lego movie. Um, and then on top of that, just, uh, you know, you know, it being unrealistic to expect a person to be creative 100% of the time. And the times when you feel you're not inspired by a project and you feel like you have to force yourself for a deadline or for, for the sake of other people's, um, you know, getting the project done, what is your technique? Have, have I ever phoned it in from home? <laughs> 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 well, well, where is home? Where is that inspiration, you know? Um, I've never faced that sort of, I've never faced that sort of uh, deadline or pressure until Fallon. But again, if it's, if it's gonna be half empty and half full, um, for all the, for all the non-education on how to write uh, direct pop songs and the idea of like coming from whatever, an artiste with an E background. <laughs> um, I'll say that, you know, a lot of the times, uh, especially on Monday, writers will already be in our studio um, 11 in the morning with a, with a laundry list of, okay, we need a, a hot dog and a whole theme and we need a lick it for 10 themes. So, you know, I'll say that a lot of my practice on, it's like, how do you get inspiration of writing a nine second theme about hot dog in a hole? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but we're so, we're such a well oiled machine. In the beginning it was weird, like, you know, and they would have these like very specific instructions, like, you know, we want it to feel like a, the Golden Girls theme, but like, <laughs> Real funky, <laughs> and then, you know, add a little trap element in there, and then you know the very specific uh, instructions. Yeah, but seriously, like, you know, the writers are really you know creative with their requests. Um, and then you know, there's sometimes where usually whatever comes to mind, I don't allow any rehearsal of any sketch or any song go over five minutes. Because then we start overthinking it. So usually the rule is, okay, we start now. And then I'll say, James, what do you have? N nothing. Come on, what do you have? <laughs> nah. Kirk, what do you have? <laughs> okay, we can use that. That's the bridge. Mark, what do you have? <laughs> and then it, it forms there. And then at the end of five minutes, that's the song. Now, you know, I mean, I think in our database now, after six years, we probably are up to fourth. 
thousand and I think we're up to forty three hundred songs of just three second songs, stingers, uh, in between shows songs and whatever. Um, and I'll say that maybe seven percent of those are really really brilliant. So <laughs> 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 this next Roots album is gonna be good. No Let's hot see. dog in the hole though. <laughs> we got um. Got uh, just a little bit of time left, but you know we also, um, and as I said at the start, you know this is a, obviously is the place where the writing program happens, and uh, you know it's the Kelly Writers House. You, uh, I mean, obviously written a lot of music, but you also just done a lot of straight up writing and uh, a lot of critical writing. And um, wonder if you could just talk about, um, you know, just kind of your recommendations for young writers, uh, you know, for people who you know, want to have maybe careers or at least, you know, kind of make a contribution as writers, you know, what kind of recommendations uh, do you give? What kind of things are helpful to you? And what are your writing tips? You know, it's, it's, I've always documented and, and wrote things. So I've kind of feel like it's a farce when people are like, oh man, we love your writing so much. Or even if I write these gargantuan sized, uh, Instagram posts or anything. Or what, five-part essays on the state of hip-hop. Right. Or well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, but I, I, I don't know. It's just, I mean, it's cliche to say, like, oh, speak your truth or whatever. But um, I don't know. I think that that habit of just always having to write, well, sometimes that serves you well and sometimes it doesn't. You know, you look at my dating life. They hate texting. <laughs> Women hate te you know, and I'm like, no, I feel comfortable. This, this way is documented. <laughs> you need evidence when you're arguing. Um, yeah, but it, I don't know. I just this it, it really just comes from the habit. I mean, I've never kept a diary, but um, I, I had a teacher back when uh, there was two years that I left performing arts to go to. Uh, a school on 17th Street called City Center Academy. Um, I was there when they first established, but back then there was like 12 of us. Um, and my uh, English teacher, Linda Boyce, like always insisted that, you know, we keep a journal and just write 15 minutes, no matter what happens, like write about anything. And I don't know, maybe I just, I've always kept that habit up and I, I maybe I feel I could communicate better not speaking. I've always had, again, a, a fear of public speaking. Again, you would never know that now. <laughs> but um, I don't, I, I don't know what the what the secret is. I mean, I don't want to sit here and perpetrate that there's an art to it, or you know, I just say you have to consistently do it a lot. You know. Well, you know, David Carr, obviously, who died recently. You know, when, you know, one of the the answer he would always give, you know, people would say, well, you know. W you know, what's the cure for writer's block? And he just said, typing. <laughs> you know, <it's> uh, <laughs> so, um, Amir, this is uh, such a thrill to have you here, Thank man. You. I, mean, I it's appreciate been it. Fantastic. And <laughs> so, uh, about, I don't know how many years ago it was, Mitch, uh, nine years at this point? A long time ago, this guy, Mitchell Blutt, uh, approached us and said, how, how can we help create an annual event where a small number of people can gather in a homey room and talk with an eminence in music in this kind of way to get all this interaction going? And, and, and you, whatever formula it was, and it obviously had a lot to do with Anthony and this space, um, it was Mitchell Blutt and Margot who made all this possible and have supported the program for all these years. And so now it's a really good time for us to thank them both for this amazing <laughs> gift. Thank you. Amazing. And. In case you didn't realize, you know, along the way how good Anthony DeCurtis is, you'll have time later to reflect on how seamless and fabulous the conversation was. So, Anthony DeCurtis. <laughs> we have a couple of copies left of this book, 
And Amir will stay, I'm sure, for a few minutes right here before he moves on to the next phase. Uh, and uh, if you want to in have him inscribe this book, I'm sure he will. But let's, one more time, welcome him back to West Philadelphia. Thank you. Questlove. Thank you, guys. Right. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for supporting the Writer's House, and come back to the Writer's House soon.